Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Semi with Tom Salmon, who's going to talk today about smart manufacturing. Tom, obviously smart manufacturing has been around for a while as a concept. People have done pieces of this. Where are we at this point? Right now we're moving from what we call an aspirational stage. Uh, people looking at sort of the theoretical side of where we're going with smart manufacturing to actual implementations. There's still a long road till we get to uh, full implementations of ML and AI uh, moving towards full predictive uh, maintenance, predictive analysis. Uh, but there are real world implementations and I think this is what we're trying to highlight through the various different semi-initiatives around smart manufacturing. And what was the first step here? I mean, was it just connecting everything together and being able to communicate, or is it now really trying to improve on the manufacturing itself? I, I think it's a little bit of both. I, the first step was definitely getting the different segments of the industry together. So we have SemiNow covers all the way from what we call materials all the way to systems. And so getting an understanding of where the different segments, whether that was the uh, uh, front end fab or the back end, uh, the OSATs, um, down into PCB assembly and EMS, where those different groups were at the different stages of smart manufacturing, pull in the software elements, the IT, the OT, get everybody connected and so that we could focus in on the priority elements. Why don't you draw this out for us? Okay. So how did you break this up? What are the different pieces that go together here? So SEMI's Smart Manufacturing Initiative and the technology community that we have around it has been working on going through a benchmarking exercise right now. We quickly realized that we couldn't cover the whole thing in one fell swoop. And so we, even within the benchmarking initiative that we have, we've broken it into four key areas so that we can understand specifically where we are in each of those areas, what are the gaps, and where do we need to be, say, three to five years on down the line. So why don't you walk through the four areas that you've highlighted? Okay. So um, I have them up here. The first one here is uh, uh, materials flow and conversion. So one of the things we need to understand is, and this, this goes across all of the segments. Remember I mentioned uh, the front end fab, the back end, down into PCB assembly and EMS. So these are agnostic across each of those. But materials flow and conversion is something that happens in each of those segments. So what are your incoming materials? What are your outbound materials? And what is happening? How are those being processed in the fab? So you'll see here, we have sort of a general representation of a manufacturing environment with the MES system here and the manufacturing down here. We need to understand the materials as they come through into the fab between the different pieces of equipment and then eventually out from coming in from the supplier and then going out to the end user here. Does it matter if it's a system on a chip versus a system in package versus a chiplet type of approach or are they all the same? Uh, fundamentally we're looking we're taking a very agnostic approach. I think once we understand once we get our first benchmark in place we'll be able to drill into a little bit more specifics but we're trying to get a holistic look at putting in place some standards best practices uh, that we could use across the whole supply chain. Security comes next. What happens in security? Because obviously there's a lot of pieces that are moving here and, and there's security on multiple levels. Right. So security obviously has been a growing concern. Uh, and there's two areas that we're working on here. One is making sure that particularly when you start connecting different entities in the supply chain here, you need to make sure that only you, the, each entity can only access the information that is pertinent to that. So you don't want certain suppliers having access to other suppliers' data. You also don't want your suppliers having access to data that should be kept within the manufacturing environment. So that's kind of the, that's sort of the, the what we call the operational technology or OT uh, component of the security. At the same time, the other component is sort of um, shielding or locking down certain environments from um, attacks or malware or other types of attacks. And so 
you want to be able to uh, make sure, for instance, that any anything that you're putting in the line here, let's say here, you want to be able to lock it down so you're not getting uh, information that's not flowing out of, out of here. And that's more of the, what, um, what we think of as the IT component of it. And your data flow plays into both security as well as efficiency inside the manufacturing operation, right? You've got to keep track of the data, but you also want to either move it or not move that data as, as uh, intelligently as you can possibly get to. Exactly. So this come, that's the, the balance that we have to play. Um, more recently, people have been talking about um, or even putting in place, and we'll have some examples of some implementations here, about smart gateways gateways at the line level so that information can be processed closer at the, uh, at the line level. But at the same time, you have to understand that we're, if we're using IoT inside the factory, that opens us up to more uh, security risks. And so we have to balance the security risks along with the data flow. So those go hand in hand. So what are the components of that? That's a complex subject with a lot of pieces in it. Yeah. So. Uh, when we get into data flow, um, data flow and uh, architectures and analysis, what the key components here are the storage. So you've got storage up here in your, your MES, and you may have some storage locally in each of the equipment. And then compute, we, we talk about the edge, um, edge gateways here, so you can have compute closer to the actual manufacturing line. We also want to make sure that the analysis is, is getting not only uh, we have data flow for the analysis in line here, but also that analysis is taking uh, advantage of big data and uh, ML and AI capabilities eventually long term. And then finally, the data flow architecture has to take into account the actual flow of data through the line and then also between the suppliers and the end users here. Where do you see AI and machine learning fit in, fitting in on this? What's the general goal here? Is it to improve manufacturing? Is it to make it more predictive? Is it to find um, problems along the way as you go? What, where does it play? So we see it in two areas specifically, and there have been some initial implementations here. One is to better use the data that's coming off of the machine. So many of the machines within the environment are cranking out probably more data. Perhaps we, in some cases, we only use 10% of the data that's actually coming off the tools. If we know the right questions to ask in advance, and if we have the capabilities with ML and AI to crunch large uh, amounts of that data, we should be able to make increase the efficiency at each of those spots within the environment. At the same time, you mentioned problem solving, and that's a good point because often when we have excur excursions within the fab, we need to be able to understand um, at a more granular level, let's say if it's on the material side, do the root cause analysis faster, and that entails being able to crunch large amounts of information, which is where the AI would come in uh, to play with specifically with respect to problem solving. This was a concept that really got going in Europe has it spread now to the rest of the industry? I think we're still seeing uh, focus in the leading edge fabs. So, um, so Europe, US, uh, Taiwan, and Korea. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's, for the new fabs that are coming online uh, across the globe in, in, in China and other areas as well too, we want to make sure that we build in these capabilities in advance. So on the for the legacy fabs, we have the challenge of retrofitting a lot of these capabilities in. And there's some, there's some good work going on there as well, too. On the greenfield side, when we're building new fabs, we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of the architectures here so that we can build in when we actually, when we actually create those new fabs. Last area that you mentioned here is the digital building blocks. Okay. What is that and how does that apply? So there's a number of digital building blocks. We include the overall architecture, uh, different standards, different layers of the system, whether that's within the FAB or in the MES system. One of the most important digital building blocks that we're working on right now uh, is the digital twin. You've probably seen this um, quite a bit. in. Uh, one of the nice things about the digital twin is we have other uh, industries that we can reference. So it's a good topic for cross-industry discussion, whether it's between uh, the semiconductor industry and aerospace or other industries. 
And what we're trying to do here is to say there's, there's the ability to off-site be able to look at um, a replica of a process, a piece of process equipment here outside of the fab or a twin of the, of the equipment here and be able to understand, um, do simulation, uh, process simulation, so that uh, ahead of time we can actually look for issues or capabilities within that equipment. We can also remotely monitor the equipment uh, to, um, to look at any excursions and eventually um, the idea that this is all this all links in together with your predictive uh, predictive analytics and predictive maintenance as well Tom Salmon. Thanks for a great explanation. Thanks so much Ed